I can hardly believe we are at week six of our study on Galatians. This is, of course, our final week. And I've got to tell you, I'm really going to miss studying the book of Galatians with you. I enjoy knowing that we are in the same place in scripture, studying and hearing the same teaching and just on this journey together. And I think that's a very biblical concept, the concept of studying God's word together, being in fellowship with one another. In fact, I think that's one of the things that you're going to see in Galatians chapter six today is this idea that we talked about back in chapter five of walking in the spirit. He's now going to talk in an application rich text about living in the spirit. Okay. And so we're going to have a lot of good practical takeaways from our teaching today. And I think that's going to be helpful for us as we conclude. But before we get into all that, I wanted to go back and just real quickly revisit Galatians 5 there at the end. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because one of the main goals of our time together in this study has been to enable and equip you to get into the Word of God on your own. And so there's different tools that we have pointed out within our small groups and our homework assignments, if you will, and the things that we've talked about in teaching that are hopefully um, equipping you to continue studying even after this study ends. And one of those things that I just want to point out to you that happened to me in my own personal study this week was I recognized something that we've been talking about in Galatians, and that is fruit. Okay, it's estimated, I read someplace that a scholar said that fruit is mentioned 66 times in the New Testament, okay? And then of course, we don't have to go very far into Genesis before we see fruit be a major player because Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, okay? And so fruit is something that God uses throughout the entirety of scripture to draw illustrations and analogies. And so that is something that when we see it come up, a recurring theme like the idea of fruit. When that is uh, throughout scripture and certainly in the places we are studying, we might just want to take a page in our journal and start identifying the places that we see it and see if we see any correlations between those times. And I did see one just this week when I was reading in Luke, in Luke chapter 13. And I want to read it to you real quick. It's a parable that Luke says Jesus told. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none, cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now here's what I would tell you. Last week, we studied the fruit of the spirit. And those are ways that uh, the Holy Spirit's are walking in the spirit is evidenced. And you know, uh, my friend Jared that's here with me filming pointed out that I didn't even read the fruit of the spirit it to you last week. Hopefully you in your uh, homework have been reading the chapter daily and different translations and things like that. And so I knew it was a familiar passage and I hope that you continue to study it in depthly. But what I want to tell you is there is another place in this parable that, uh, that fruit is used in the context of fruitlessness. And that is there in Luke chapter 13. And so I want to see what we might could glean from these contrasts passages of scripture, okay? What I believe that Luke is telling us here and conveying to us is that there is a judgment associated with fruitlessness, okay? We, we saw in Galatians 5 how our walking in the spirit is evidenced through fruit, but what does the lack of fruit tell us? Well, it tells us that we are in danger of being judged, okay? Tony Evans said recently, just this week, in fact, on the issue of racial division and the racial unrest that's taking place in our country, he said, this is not a time for secret agent Christians. Christians, okay? It's not a time for secret agent Christians. And I think what Paul and Dr. Tony Evans would agree with is there's no such thing, okay? And what we see is looking at this parable in scripture in the book of Luke, if we are not bearing fruit, this begs a question. And that question is, are we in the spirit? 
Are we walking in the spirit? Have we ever had a time in which we have transferred our trust in self over to trust in Christ and accepted the grace that has been lavished upon us through the work done at the cross? And if we are not bearing fruit, that question needs to be asked of ourselves, okay? Because why? Because judgment awaits. Listen, we don't wanna be taking up space in the ground because the verses before that uh, parable in verse six is talking about how accidents, calamities, destruction happens. You don't know when it's going to befall you. And so you want to be ready. You want to be bearing fruit. You do not want to be sitting on that judgment seat. Okay. So that's one way that as you're studying scripture and you begin to see themes emerge and things that seem familiar to you, look those up, chase those down, see if there are correlations relations between them and how you can employ those and apply those in your own walk with the Lord. So moving on now, we've talked about living, I mean, walking in the spirit. We are now going to talk about in chapter six, living in the spirit in the context of the body of Christ, living in the spirit in the context of the body of Christ. So read with me just right there at the top of the chapter. We'll see that Paul is going to return to that familial reference of brothers to the church in Galatia and uh, follow along with me. Brothers, if any is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Now that word caught in our sensational society probably conjures images of a front page headline of somebody that is perhaps even a public figure that has been caught doing something they should not do. And whereas I do feel like that description of being caught in sin would encompass such a situation, what I can tell you is it more likely refers to being entangled with sin, to being overtaken with sin. And the fact that we're talking within that context of family also tells us that these are people that you would see walking alongside of you in the body of Christ. Okay, so it's not necessarily some scandalous sin, it's really any sin that is entangling a brother or a sister or overtaking a brother and sister as they are trying to walk in the spirit, okay? And so what we are going to see is that Paul is going to call us to restore these brothers and sisters. And he gives us three admonitions about this, and we're gonna unpack those just real briefly before we move on. The first thing we see is that restorers need to be in right standing spiritually. Restorers need to be in right standing spiritually. Notice that Paul didn't say, okay, those of you that are over the age of 40, you are called to restore the body of Christ. Or, hey, need my Enneagram one, three, and sevens to be our restorers, okay? No, it was nothing like that. What Paul says is that we need the spiritually mature, okay? The spiritually ready. Now, how do we know that? How do we uh, glean that from what we uh, said? Well, one thing, what Paul said, one thing is that it's in very close proximity to chapter five where he was talking about walking in the spirit. So one can assume assume by the very proximity of this passage to the last that he is speaking about people that are walking in the spirit and the fact that he describes these people that are called to restore as spiritual means that there is some evidence of the spirit within them that would identify them that way. Okay. And so we are talking about people that are mature in their walk with Christ that are called to come along and restore fellow Christians who are are we not talking about? We are not talking about the woman that has been, uh, that has left the church two decades ago angry and is walking in the flesh, that is not evidencing any fruit of the spirit, but knows just enough scripture to be able to recognize sin in someone else's life. No, that is not who is called to restore. We as people of faith that are spiritually mature are called to be the restorers. So we must be in right standing spiritually, okay? The second Second thing we see here is that restorers must be gentle. 
restorers must be gentle, okay? The Greek word that is translated for restore in this passage would have been used in a secular context to mean mending broken bones, okay? Setting bones back together. It's used again in the chap in the verse, uh, the book of Mark to mean mending fishnets, okay? So in both of those situations, what we see is required is care and delicacy, okay? There's a gentleness to restoration, okay? And I think, I'm just being honest, we're just gonna lay it out on the table today. There are two ditches that we as Christ Christians can fall into when we are trying to walk that path of gentle restoration, okay? And the first ditch is something that is referred to as cancel culture cancel culture. Perhaps you are familiar with this. It is basically in every news story, in everything that you see headlined today, we see the prevalence of cancel culture. And what cancel culture is that if you say or think differently than me, then I am canceling you out. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. I do not want to build a bridge. I do not want to be associated with you. That is one of the reasons why you see such stark division these days. We have become a cancel culture. And let me see if I can uh, take this down more to a level that you would relate to just within your own circle of friends. Perhaps you've been on social media and seen a post like this. If you support politician A's position on issue B, then go on and unfriend me right now. Maybe you've seen something like that. That is cancel culture. And what that is saying is, if you disagree with me, I don't wanna hear anything you have to say. I don't wanna to talk to you. I don't wanna to listen to you. I don't wanna hear your perspective. It's really canceling the person out entirely. And here's what we need to understand, okay? Cancel culture is counter Christian. Okay, did you get that? Cancel culture is counter Christian. We are not given permission to cancel out people that disagree with us. And especially within the body of believers, we are called to restore gently. We are called to make inroads, okay? We don't get the luxury of canceling them out, okay? So that's the first ditch that we have to be careful not to fall into when we're on that road to gentle restoration. The other one, strangely, enough is our own misuse and misunderstanding of scripture. Listen, I don't think in all the time that I've been doing ministry that I have heard more errant theology than is surrounding the issue of judgment and restoration. Okay. There is a lot of errant theology out there. And what I would tell you is that we like to uh, cloak our judginess in righteous truth, calling out righteous truth about as much as we like to shirk away from our responsibility to call out sin by saying, hey, it's not my place to judge. So we are, we are happy to live on both ends of that spectrum, but neither one of them are founded in the truth of scripture, even though we often use scripture as, a, uh, as an argument for our position. So let's just go on right now and clear this up. You know, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I do have other people in my home that have the TV on a lot and there's been a commercial lately that as I've been walking through the den and hearing TV, I've seen, and it always kind of makes me chuckle. And it's this couple that are standing in front of their cute little house in their new neighborhood. And they're talking about how much they love their house and how much they love the neighborhood and the schools. And meanwhile, Cynthia from the HOA, okay, is taking a uh, tape measure to their shrubs and saying, oops, you know what, not board approved. She's clipping down their hanging baskets because those are not board approved. She's taking a chainsaw to their mailbox. Maybe you've seen this, two inches too high, okay? And here's what I wanna tell you. We have not been elected to the HOA of righteousness, okay? We don't need to be Cynthia. The body of Christ does not need a Cynthia among us, okay? We are not called to be the righteous police. That is not how we are to confront with truth, okay? That's the first way. But then the second way is this way of, hey, I see what's going on over here, but you know what? That's not my problem. I mean, I don't wanna judge. Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not lest you be judged. Well, let's look a little bit further in that passage and let's see what it says in Matthew 7, verse 5. 
First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye, okay? What is he saying there? He's saying that, do you know what? You do need to get right with God. And we, we talked about that in our first point. We are called to be spiritually mature, okay? So we are called to be self-reflective. We are called to be walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, and make sure first and foremost, there is not sin in our own life that needs to be called out. But then, but then we are also called to look and to restore the brothers and sisters around us that are entangled, overtaken with sin. This is a concept that is reiterated throughout the New Testament and specifically by James in chapter five. Let me read to you verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That is pretty clear that we are called to restore, okay? We are to gently restore brothers and sisters who have fallen away and are entangled in sin, okay? And then the third thing that we see there is that restorers need to be cautious. Restorers need to be cautious. And he'll reiterate that point by saying, hey, listen, don't go thinking you've got it together, okay? Don't go with any sense of pride. Don't even go, heaven forbid, thinking that, hey, I'm pretty good at this walking with the spirit thing. So I'm the best person to go. There's, there should be no pride among us when we go to gently restore a brother or a sister. We do that in humility. Perhaps you've heard it said, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, we would do well when uh, employing restoration to keep that in mind. Listen, we are all susceptible to sin. Remember last week when we talked about our DNA report and it says that, hey, guess what? We are prone to sin. We are prone to sin. So we always need to restore with caution, very carefully not to get entangled in the sin ourselves, okay? Now I'm four pages into my notes and we've only covered Verse one, so we're gonna have to pick up the pace a little bit, okay? So we're gonna go on to verse two, and of course we've read two through five, and uh, we are going to move along a little quickly here, but I wanna quickly, before I address verse two, which I feel like is going to be one of the most important verses probably within our whole book of Galatians, I wanna point out something that could trip you up in your personal study, and that is that there are two different understandings of the word burdens or loads, okay? In verse two, we are told to bear one another's burdens. These burdens, this load refers to a load or a burden that is crushing, that is too heavy to bear alone, okay? So that's the kind of load and burden we're speaking of in verse two. In verse five, Paul goes on and seems to contradict himself by saying, hey, we are all called to bear our own load, okay? This is a different type of load. This load would refer to like a military pack, something that a foot soldier would be uh, wearing in his assignment. And so really the correlation there is that we are supposed to walk according to how God has called us, what he has given us to carry as believers. And what we know about that from other places in scripture is that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. Okay. And so it's two different types of load, but I want to camp out for just a moment back at verse two bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What Paul is going to do right here is give us a very practical way in which we can uh, demonstrate our love for God and our love for others by bearing one another's burdens. Now you've possibly heard me say before, and I don't want to get too deep into our theology, but you've pro possibly heard me talk about exegesis and hermeneutics. Exegesis is how something would have been interpreted and received in the then and there, and hermeneutics is something how we would interpret it in the here and now. And those two cannot mean different things, okay? So we cannot take a lesson from uh, from Paul 2,000 years ago and change it to mean something that is more relevant to our context. But we can contextualize it in the sense that the message remains the same. And so here's what I want to, to say to you today. I do not think in verse two that Paul is calling out systemic racism that was happening in the known world at the time. I just don't think that's the case, okay? So I don't think that we can make a case for that in our present day. But here's what I will tell you. 
I do think it's very clear within scripture and throughout Galatians especially that Paul has made a very strong argument that there are no distinctions among believers. All are welcome. All are full heirs when they place their trust in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. I think we can very comfortably extend that to mean there is no black, white, red, yellow, just as the song says that we sing when we're a little child, okay? So I think we're, we're, we're confident in that, okay? And given that, here's what I also think. I also think that in the summer of 2020, because of God's divine divine timing. That's, that's the only thing I can attribute it to. Okay. We've talked about how he foreknew and foredestined the perfect time in history when he would send Christ to be our savior and our deliverer. I don't know ladies why it's taken this long in our history to have the issue of racial injustice, uh, really take a front seat on the, on the world scene. But for whatever reason, it appears that we have now been very keenly made aware that our black brothers and sisters are bearing a crushing weight that they cannot bear alone. Okay. And so I think very clearly we can apply Galatians 6, 2 to mean that it is our time to now go and be involved and engaged and help carry the load that has been brought to our attention that is crushing people of color in our country. I think that is a very uh, clear hermeneutic in, uh, in reference to what is going on right now and how it could have been uh, given to us at the time. Bearing one another's burdens is a very biblical concept. And here's what I would tell you. I can remember several uh, years ago being in counseling with my husband and we weren't really in danger of anything bad happening, but we just needed some help. We were just, we were just in a season of dealing with the same old things and we needed some truth spoken into us. And so we went to a Christian counselor and he was very faithful to deliver some truth from God's word. And I remember shaking my head and he said, what, what do you not agree? And I was like, no, I agree. I just, I don't understand why it took this long in our marriage for me to hear this. I wish I had heard it back in year one. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why this seems to be the right time, but do you know what my counselor said? He said, well, you've heard the truth today, so allow the Holy Spirit to change you and move forward in that truth. Ladies, perhaps you are just now becoming cognizant of what has been going on all around us. I think that is the case for many of us. Perhaps we have not ever had the opportunity to recognize the burdens that some of our brothers and sisters are carrying surrounding the issue of color and race, okay? But we have heard it now. And so what I would tell you is allow the spirit to now move you forward, to bear one another's burdens, to fulfill fill this calling that we have as believers and not allow those among us to be crushed. Amen? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna say about that and we are going to go on and again, move a little bit quicker and we are going to return to that theme that we've been talking about in all of Galatians 6, which is living in the spirit in context with the body of Christ, okay? He's returned, as we talked about, to this relational language of family, and then he's gonna just give us some practical applications of how we live in a family relationship with one another. And one of the first ways he's gonna tell us, um, beginning in verse six, is that we are going to be uh, called to take care of those who are teaching. He's gonna call teachers to be faithful in sharing the word of God, to be clear in their message, to not deliver a false gospel. And then he's going to likewise tell those who receive sound teaching. You have a responsibility to take care of the teachers among you. And what he's referring to here is financially, to take care, to make sure that they are clothed and fed and have funds, okay, so that the gospel can advance and they can concentrate on delivering the message that you need to hear. So he's going to talk about that. That's living in context with one another, okay? He's going to talk about sowing and reaping in the flesh, and he's gonna contrast that with sowing and reaping in the spirit. And as you can imagine, when we sow and reap in the flesh, the outcomes are sinful and destructive. When we sow and reap in the spirit, those outcomes are going to be eternal, 
okay? And then skip down to verse nine with me. And I think you're gonna see something that perhaps if you've been in the word of God for very long, you're familiar with. Let me read to you. And let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, context, okay? He's speaking to the universal obligation of believers in Christ to do good. We are to be consistent in who we are as followers of Christ, okay? But then he's going to single out our context in living with the body of believers, and he's going to say, in a especially we are to look for opportunities to do good to one another. Those of us that are walking and living in the spirit. Okay. It's that context of uh, the same thing that he's really talking about when he's talking about restoring other believers. Listen, it's fine to walk individually, but when you recognize that you're part of a body, then when some part of the body is sick or broken or not well, then you need to make sure that you are particularly taking care of that, okay? Because then we can operate as the body of Christ and do more good, okay? So it's not necessarily calling the church to like a church programming point, okay? That's not what's happening, that we should be doing good. No, we should, because we're a body of believers, okay? But really what he's speaking to right here is the universal call on believers to do good in their context to all their neighbors and wherever they live and serve and work, but especially to look for opportunities to do good within the body of believers, okay? And then we are going to skip down to this final section and we are going to to wrap it up. We are going to see him really drive home everything that he has been saying throughout the entire book of Galatians. Read with me beginning in verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, I think it's very clear. We we posed this question, I believe, in one of the very first weeks that we studied together about what does scripture teach us about mankind? I think we can see clearly in the book of Galatians that mankind needs to hear something more than one time because Paul continues to reiterate this message and call out this false teaching of the Judaizers, okay? So he's going to take one last very strong, substantial stab at the Judaizers who are trying to add the law back over into a grace salvation. And he's going to make a resounding, once again, affirmation of the work that was done on the cross. Okay, so that's where we are going to land here today. It is always about the gospel with Paul. It's always about the gospel. And here's where I think our takeaway, where our application point is. Let me read verse 14 to you one more time. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Listen, as our time together comes to a close in the book of Galatians, would I would you allow me to pose this question to you? And I'm posing it right back to myself. Can you and I, in all sincerity, sign our name to the words of Paul in verse 14? Can we trade in the successes and achievements and comforts and failures and hurts and disappointments that the world has uh, doled out to us, whatever that might, might look like in your individual life can, life? can you crucify the world and all of the things that go along with it to the cross and boast in the relationship and the grace that has been extended to you by the work on the cross? If we do not learn 
to move forward and walk in the spirit and live in the spirit, then we will never be able to live out verse 14 in the ways, the strong ways that Paul is calling us to do and setting the example of doing. You know, we are going to not be meeting each week together and studying in scripture, but we are hopefully on a lifelong journey to study God's word, to walk in his spirit and to live in the body of believers. And that is going to be key to our success at this is our ability to crucify the world and to boast only in Christ. And one of the ways that we're gonna do that is we've gotta stay in God's word. I feel like I am beating a dead horse at this point, but we are on a journey that does not end. You're never gonna master the scriptures, but you are going to have the opportunity to use your Bible as a handbook for the rest of your life. And what I can promise you is there's not one thing that the future holds that God is not willing and able and waiting to walk with you through, okay? So there's whatever it is that happens after this time together in the book of Galatians, what I can tell you is there is an answer and an encouragement and a roadmap found in scripture. And so I'm going to encourage you wherever you are, perhaps you're joining us and you're not even local. There's no way you could get plugged into the ministries of Prestonwood. I would tell you, find a body of believers. Paul is telling us very clearly that we are to operate within the body. We are not lone wolves, okay? So find a group of believing sisters in Christ that you can walk alongside. And if you are local, I would invite you to be a part of all that's going on at Prestonwood. And whether you're local or not, you can follow us on our social media platforms. You can engage with us through some of our online teaching. And we would love to continue to partner with you in pointing you to God's word. But that is going to be the key. It is always going to be God's word that is the answer for whatever is going on in our lives, in our worlds. Okay. And so happy studying. Let this not be an ending, but a beginning to something new, a new discipline that is in our lives as believers to live in the body of Christ and walk in the spirit. Until next time.